San Antonio tonight here on NBA TV. DeMar DeRozan just 5 of 14 in that game in no disrespect to the Rockets, but what can only be described as a bad loss for <laughs> the Spurs. Part two of that two-game series happens next here on NBA TV. Hey, everybody. Great to have you with us for the CarMax pregame. That is Dennis Scott right over there. I'm Matt Weiner. Good to see you with us. Uh, our game coming up at the top of the hour, and of course, we'll be keeping a very close eye on Brooklyn, where tonight James Harden will make his Nets debut. He'll be in the starting lineup for the Nets as they take on the Orlando Magic. Uh, all four teams, all seven players have cleared. The trade is now complete, and everybody can move on with their new teams. Of course, the Rockets granted Harden's wish by trading the three-time scoring champ to Brooklyn, where at some point he figures to complete a Nets big three along with his former teammate Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. Between them, they have 24 all-star selections, seven scoring titles along the way. Steve Nash a short time ago talked about Harden and what he means to this team. Excited. You know, we we welcome one of the best players in the game to our team. So uh, there's a lot of excitement just on his resume and his talent uh, and his excitement to be here. So the mood is great. And, um, you know, this is just uh, tonight is the first step having him play, a, you know, a real game with us after, uh, you know, not really any preparation time. You know, this this is a moving target that we have to try to incorporate him as we go here and uh, and, you know, learn on the fly, adapt and try to gel and come together and put each of our guys in a position to succeed. How close are we to Kyrie Irving rejoining everybody and being ready to play as well? Yeah, hopefully we're close. You know, I can't really give you a firm update on that. We have to assess that as we go. We do want to make sure he ramps up accordingly so that he's not susceptible to unnecessary injury um, and protect him the best we can. But hopefully it's a short period of time. And, uh, you know, uh, that is uh, to be determined, though. Brian Lewis, New York Post. Hey, Steve, I, I know uh, basketball is fairly universal, but I mean, when you're playing today, James hasn't had any practice time at all. Uh, do you have to basically have a, a James Harden offense and then readjust that again whenever Kyrie comes back and have a Kyrie and James Harden? Or do you just say, we do what we do and he'll work it out? I think it's somewhere in the middle. You know, I think James is familiar with some of the sets we're going to run. Uh, we're trying to keep it very simple uh, tonight. Um, you know, the, the trick in a sense of the process is, is having our three guys uh, learn to play with one another, off one another. Um, and that goes for the whole roster, but primarily those three in that they, you know, in, an, in a unique position in a sense uh, to be playing together for the first time and to be sharing the load like this. So um, that's a process and it's a process for our team, but it's uniquely a process for those three as well. So that, that will take time and it's a great problem to have. It is a fascinating equation now in Brooklyn, and it, it is a good problem to have, as Steve Nash said, but it, it is a little bit of a problem when you yeah. have three alpha offensive players and three of the top usage rate guys actively in the NBA. And really, if you consider the roles currently of DeMarcus Cousins and Carmelo Anthony, you're talking about three of the top five right. usage rate guys in the NBA right now, all at some point playing together. Now, we've asked similar questions of James Harden when he was with Chris Paul and when he was with Russell Westbrook. Mm -hmm. We ask it again now with Durant and, at some point, Kyrie Irving. How does this work? Well, I, I think Steve Nash is going to have to figure out which guy is willing to sacrifice more. We saw Kevin Durant go to Golden State, and he sacrificed because he figured out how do I blend in with Steph Curry and Klay Thompson. They went on to win championships. Now it's up to Kyrie and KD to have that heart-to-heart -heart conversation with James Harden. Like, hey, guy, we know you're an MVP candidate. We know you can lead the league in scoring, but... This is what we've done to win championships. Kyrie can say, you know what? I might have acted, you know, the wrong way in Boston. Or, but, but guess what? Let me remind you guys that I was pretty good when I played with LeBron and Kevin Love back in Cleveland. So how do we have a heart-to-heart, -heart, real basketball conversation? Because you're right, Matt. On paper, that's three one-on-one -on -one alpha dogs. My turn, your turn, my yeah. turn, your turn. Are you going to play defense? Well, I'm not playing defense. You're going to play defense? <laughs> I think that's the bigger problem. Kevin Durant has showed us he'll go rebound the basketball. The other night, he showed us he'll get 13, 14, 15 assists. But on, the, on a, any given night, Matt, Who's going to play that defense? We saw Chris Bosh in Miami 
give up his offense and block shots and rebounds and take charges to win championships. That's what I want to see. That's the message I think Steve Nash has to send. Guys, we know all y'all can score. Y'all have that green light and take the ball whenever you want to. But how are you guys going to come together along with DeAndre Jordan? Oh, wait a minute, Matt. What if he gets in foul trouble? Right. Jeff Green has to play some five. Kevin Durant might have Kevin to play Durant. some five. So those are bigger problems versus talking about scoring and all the ball handling stuff. That's when you really get deep into that coaches of meeting and saying, how are we going to win ball games consistently when we play the better teams? Durant, to me, is the least of their problems offensively because he can play without the ball. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need tons of shots to nope. score 25 or 30. That's right. Um, they can use him in pick and roll if they want to. He hasn't done a ton of that in his career, but – with Harden, with Kyrie Irving, of course. It's the other two who basically are both point guards, mm -hmm. uh, both shoot first point guards. I mean, Harden racks up a bunch of assists or has in Houston, but it's mostly off him driving and kicking to folks. So I, I wonder what the offense will look like, you know, beyond the questions about defense, which is a whole other discussion, but right. what the offense will look like when the three of them are on the floor. Well, I think that's what I think Steve is trying to figure out. If we have some type of flow, if we're in the half-court set, what does that initial play look like? If you're in the pick-and-roll where you're playing to James Harden's strength, yes, be in the pick-and-roll, but if it's a 1-3 pick-and-roll, they're probably going to switch that, Matt. And now, guess what? You're feeding right into the defense's hand, one-on-one -on -one basketball, everyone stands still, and now it's all sets of eyes on the one-on-one -on -one player. That's the thing that Steve Nash has to figure out is how do we get flow? Is it 1-5 pick and roll? Now it's harder to switch because now DeAndre Jordan's on the point guard and now you can, you know, go at the mismatch. As Steve Nash navigates through those problems, they'll figure it out. But still, Matt, the, the more defense you play and get stops, mm -hmm. now you're in transition, less half-court sets, and these guys can flourish that way. You know, normally I would say that's a real question mark because both – Harden and Irving are considered minus defenders. Of course. Durant certainly has his moments as a rim protector. Um, but I don't know. The league has shifted so – is tilted so much on the – to the offensive side of things. I don't even know if it matters anymore. I think you have to have – possessions here or there when you can make some stops, but you no longer have to be an elite defensive team. Matt, it's true in the regular season. You're right on point. But we've seen, even in the bubble, the reason the Lakers won is because Anthony Davis and the rest of those guys played the defense yeah. and took the Nuggets' life away, right? You get to the finals. Miami was great. Got down to the point, the Lakers locked them down and won the championship. And if we believe Brooklyn is that good offensively, they're going to have to figure out a way to play some type of championship defense. Otherwise, they're going home early like the Clippers did. Yeah. All that offense, but they couldn't figure out a way to play championship defense. That's why they went home early. The difference is the Lakers were really good defensively That's all right. season long. All season not long. Just in the and post. then turned it up. Yeah. When things got a little shaky, there sure. you go. They got back better. Yeah. Do the, do the Brooklyn Nets have that gear defensively? I, I, we don't know yet. We've we got to wait and see that. And that's the part where people – why are we already judging? We haven't given Steve Nash a chance to have a few practices and get guys on the same page. Some people are like, automatic champions. No, no, no. I want to wait and see. Let's let them play a couple no, games No, no, no. We can't do that. We have to do it immediately. <laughs> you have to have a hot take. That's what we do. You have to get, like, way ahead of the thing before it ever happens. Of course, this is not the, uh, the first team to try their hand at a big three. They become the latest. That label first came about, in my memory at least, when the Celtics added Kevin Garnett yep. and Ray Allen to Paul Pierce in Boston. They won a title, of course. Miami followed. LeBron, Chris Bosh joined up with Dwayne Wade. They made it to four straight finals, won a pair of championships. And, of course, Kevin Durant was already part of a big three when he joined the Warriors and won a pair of finals MVPs playing alongside Steph Curry and Klay Thompson before getting hurt in the finals of year three. Now, KD, Kyrie, and James Harden, oh. and of course, 3D, <laughs> you know a little something about formidable trios. Oh, man. Don't you? Kenny Anderson, I Ryan Oliver, <laughs> Georgia Tech's first ever Final Four team. Wow. And by the way, for folks who don't live in Atlanta, we are like 100 yards from their, their basketball gym where we sit here. Whose idea was this? Whose idea was this? No, this is awesome. K.A., Brian Oliver. Oh, man, Matt, the good old days. But, hey. We all sacrificed. I got to give a big shout-out to uh, Malcolm Mackey and Johnny McNeil. They are part of the starting lineup. But look at those numbers, man. We were getting buckets. Well, that's crazy for Ooh, a college wee. program to have three players average 20 or more. That's Ooh, really hard to do in a 40-minute game. My goodness, man, we was getting buckets like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. <laughs> but the way the game's playing, you're up and down. You're playing more. You're shooting more threes. But I say it again. I got to give Malcolm Mackey and Johnny McNeil doing the dirty work, setting those screens. And, of course, Bobby Crimmins giving – me and uh, Kenny Anderson, the freedom to go out there and play. And a guy like Brian Oliver, he sacrificed and did all the Ooh. defense and all the things we're talking about because he could score at will. Ooh, Mac, we are leaving it. 
Oh, and how? Whoa, 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 whoa. That, can we put that on Diesel's dunk this week? Sure, sure, we can try to make that happen. We'll see if we can convert it from Betamax or whatever that was. And that was real grainy, right? That's a little, that little grainy. grainy. I wasn't entirely sure that was you until we saw the close-up. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right, much Good more stuff. coming up here on the CarMax pregame, uh, heading to tip between the Rockets and the San Antonio Spurs. Revenge on the mind of LaMarcus Aldridge and the Spurs. That's coming up, but first, it's the season premiere of Chuck's Guarantees. That's next. Antonio trying to get one back after dropping a home game to the Rockets on Thursday. So in the first edition of 2020 Shooter's Paradise, I had a chance to sit down with Steph Curry's high school coach, Sean Brown. And he reflects on the first time he had to give Steph Curry the keys to his, what? His program. And that's when Chef Curry was born. Welcome to another edition of Shooter's Paradise. I'm super excited to talk to Coach Sean Brown of Christian School in Charlotte. And yes, we're talking about the great Steph Curry. Take us back to the first time you saw him shoot the basketball and what went through your mind? Probably just watching Stefan in middle school and just how he'd go up and down the floor and just kind of let it fly at will. And you would just go, man, this guy, he, does he ever miss? Was it surprising? Because when you go back and look at those old videos and pictures, he is skinny as a noodle. Like, what's going through your mind? Like, this skinny kid is jacking up shots, playing free spirit. How did you know to let that free? Uh, because he understood how to really play the game. And I'll give one uh, quick example of that. So at the end of his freshman year, we brought him up for our state tournament. Mm. And I always knew throughout the year that we would bring him up towards the end. So we put him in kind of towards the end of the game. Uh, he dribbles down. I think, I think he passed it. He caught it back. He lets it rip. Uh, it's nothing but net. And I look right over. Uh, Coach Housen was the name. Coach David Housen, one of my assistants at the time. I look over and I said, Coach, we're giving this kid the keys to our program, you know, the next three years. Wow. Uh, and we had a pretty special three-year run. Um, I mean, we're talking about Stefan now, but we had a lot of good players to us around him as well. When you look back on that, did, did it ever say to you, why weren't the bigger name coaches coming into the gym? Well, my, my take on that would be, first of all, you know, being a Christ follower that God had under control the whole time. But to answer right. your question, uh, I simply think he just didn't pass the eye test. He has some skills that you can't give to him. He already possesses that. You know, the the gaining of weight, helping him maybe become a little bit quicker and all those things, you can teach him. And then he had a great uh, person in his father to continuously walk him through stages of that. Maybe on the nights, maybe he was not as consistent, knocking down shots that good shooters, now great shooters, you continue to shoot. Is there one thing that marvels you more, the father, the husband, the philanthropist, how hard he works? What marvels you the most about that? I would say in all of his success, uh, again, going back to him being a product of a, a Christian family, a Christian school, him remaining solid in his faith, keeping his family first. And then uh, in this game of basketball, he's really been able to utilize that, I think, to reach others in a positive uh, manner. With all the accolades, he continues to be humble. Uh, but for him in particular, staying true to his faith, uh, it's been really awesome to watch him grow in that manner. Did you see this greatness then? Or were, we, or were you saying, no, he was really good? I ain't think he'd be this good. Uh, we just firmly believe if he was ever given a chance because of his work ethic uh, and, and partly also because of just how Bell and Sonia did a tremendous job rearing their kids, um, that you crack the door of opportunity, he would figure out a way how to take advantage of that and that that work ethic would take him a very long way. Very proud of what he's doing currently. Um, and even if he was to watch this, I'd want to say to you, Stefan, right now, again, Charlotte Christian as a whole cannot be proud of you as well as all the other guys that have gone through in this program but we continue to pray for you um, and want you to continue to do well and keep the name of Jesus on the forefront of what you're doing. The mm -hmm. progression of Stephen Curry is just phenomenal when you yeah. think of not highly recruited out of high school uh, Davidson 
smaller school, not necessarily the uh, power conference competition on a, on a regular basis. He was only a seventh pick, and it took him, what, four or five years? No, probably five, six years to be an all-star even. And look, look at what he's become. And I think, Matt, that's the uh, fun part about his journey and his story because uh, most people say, well, he's, he's the son of an NBA dad. Well, a lot of us didn't have NBA dads or NBA moms, WNBA moms to be in this situation. It's a skill set you're born with. But I think it's more so the hard work I don't think we give him enough credit for. Because like Coach said, he didn't pass the eye test. And I'm just like, well, if we knew he could shoot like this, well, he was still skinny at 16 years old. Mm -hmm. So back then, a 16-year-old skinny shooting the ball from the hash mark wasn't cachet. It wasn't cool then. It wasn't okay. He made it okay. So he yeah. kind of changed the game to today. So that's why it's fun when you have these conversations with high school coach. You say, well, he's the, was he the best prep player to coach? He goes, yes, he scored 62 the other night. I said, no, coach. I'm going to ask you again. Was he the best prep player you coach? Right. He goes, no. He wasn't because he had him his freshman year. He didn't play. It was a sophomore, junior, and senior he played. But there were other guys that started there all four years. But they went to certain colleges. They advanced. They didn't go to the NBA like Steph did. So that's why it's fun to go back to the high school so the high school coach can really tell you what he saw back then versus what we see now. It's also really interesting, the timing of his career as well. And it's a little bit of a chicken or mm -hmm. egg thing they in call. terms of what's an acceptable shot now versus 10, 15 years ago. Yes. The league was already expanding to more of a perimeter game, more three-point shooting, but he was an accelerant. I no. mean, it really took off when he started doing what he started doing in the NBA. Brian Hill, Matty Gukas, all the coaches I had my first couple of years, thank you very much for allowing 3D to do his thing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but not, you didn't have right. the freedom even. Exactly. Freedom. I, I, it was still pulling two of the take 11 yeah, threes. Yeah. I had to prove I can make five or six in a row. Well, let him shoot another one. Right. <laughs> right. All right. Good stuff. More uh, coming up here on the CarMax. Christian Wood had 27 and 15 boards in the Rockets' win over the Spurs on Thursday. He has 15 threes in nine games so far. Wow. That's more than he hit his first three seasons in the NBA. In other words, it has taken a minute for him to find his way as a pro. Wood played a couple of seasons at UNLV, but he went undrafted in 2015 after spending time with the Rockets' summer league team, signed with the 76ers, made his NBA debut with Philly that season, bounced back and forth with their G League team, then to the Hornets, shuttled back and forth with their G League team, uh, agreed to a deal with a Chinese team. Back to Delaware, I'm way behind on the map. Way, way behind. <laughs> so Milwaukee there, with their G League team, Milwaukee waved in. The Pelicans picked him up. He played eight games there, waved again, claimed by the Pistons, put up big numbers last year in limited minutes, and eventually found his way to Houston to sign and trade. Where he's been terrific so far for this Rockets team. And post-James Harden, which is the era we're now in, right. in Houston, he figures to be part of what it is at the moment kind of an uncertain future. The best story in basketball, Matt. It's easy to follow the McDonald's All-American. It's easy to follow that guy's the, the college player of the year and wins the championship in the Final Four. But these are the guys that we kind of give up on, forget about. Oh, he had a little flash in the pan in college. Or he may have left school early because someone said he should have, but things didn't work out right away. But continue to work, continue to believe in himself. The interview he did with Shaq and Charles and Kenny the other night on TNT, I thought it was perfect. He said the mama mentality. And social media was like, oh, what is he talking about? He said it like five times. Exactly. <laughs> but you could tell the difference from people that understood what he was saying and trying to say, oh, he's trying to compare himself to Kobe. No, he had a mentality he had to stick with because nobody believed in him. But that mentality he used got him a handsome contract in Houston playing and playing meaningful minutes, and they need him to win ball games. It is so a, kudos to him. It's a little surprising given that he is such a modern-day yes. big-type player yes. that he hadn't caught on earlier than this. Wood is available tonight, which makes him a little unusual for the Rockets right. because uh, <laughs> after this trade happened on Wednesday, you had to have everybody pass physicals to become available. They've got injury issues as well. Both DeMarcus Cousins and John Wall and Eric Gardner are out with uh, injuries. Daniel House Jr. likewise out with a back injury. Dante Exum, because of the trade, is not yet available. Same with Victor Oladipo. Sterling Brown out with a leg injury. You get medical the idea. Sta medical staff's busy. So basically, they have <laughs> just enough wow. to play here. Wait till you see the starting lineup for, for Houston. Who he uh, played for? 
There's a little of that. There's a little of that. They get set to take on the San Antonio Spurs. But you're right about Christian Wood. Good for him for sticking yep. with it. That's right. And producing. Got a nice deal this offseason and that sign and trade deal with the Houston Rockets. And he is set to go against the Spurs in just